Good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks to the Clinton School, to Dean Rutherford, and to Sarah for those wonderful introductions. Uh, and we are delighted. This is our second time here this season. We were here earlier with, uh, to discuss our production of Hamlet. And we're very delighted to be back to discuss our production of A Raisin in the Sun. We got the names right and everything. We weren't sure when to come out. You know, entrances are very important to theater people. Uh, and, and we were able to line ourselves up alphabetically and be successful all at the same time. So this is a big day. And, uh, you know, it is because tonight is the first uh, preview performance of A Raisin in the Sun at the Rep. And so it is a time when these guys have a lot on their mind. Uh, we finished our technical rehearsals over the weekend, our dress rehearsals over the weekend. Uh, they sort of had a day off yesterday, but we had all manner of events planned for them yesterday. Uh, and so they've had a busy time here uh, in Arkansas. Now Phyllis, as you know, is a native of, of these, these parts, and everyone else is coming to us as our guest, and we're delighted to have them here. Rajendra, our director, this is your fifth production at the Rep, uh, uh, coming to us originally with our production of Dream Girls, uh, Intimate Apparel. Of course, I think many of you may recognize Rajendra because he directed, it happened in Little Rock for us, also wrote that piece. Uh, and so Regender has a long and proud history with Arkansas Rep. You know, when we pick a season, so many things go into that conversation. And we talk about what stories we want to tell at Arkansas Rep. We want to have a diverse offering of plays. And if you look at any given scene, you see a wide range of plays, from new plays to comedies to classics uh, to very crowd-pleasing musicals and musical reviews. And that's a pretty consistent for our season. We began our conversation about A Raisin in the Sun. It's been over a year ago now, I think, Regender. We've talked about it on and off uh, for a variety of years, about when can we do a play of this magnitude. The rep, in its 35 years, has never tackled A Raisin in the Sun. And sometimes these plays with huge artistic footprints are intimidating, although few things intimidate us at the rep in terms of, of plays that we want to tackle. But this one has special meaning to all of us. It has special meaning to those of us at the Rep, to our board of directors, and of course to our cast that Regendra has assembled for this production. You know, I, and I want to be careful too because we talk about A Raisin in the Sun being an important play, uh, being a significant play, being an historic play. But you know, that puts the play on a pedestal and sometimes makes it unreachable and unattainable and inaccessible. And we never want to create work at the Rep that is any of those things. We treat every play as if we're looking at it for the very first time. And in our conversation today, I want to ask these actors how they approach their roles and how they bring life to their play, to, to, to this story. But the point I want to make as we get started is, at the bottom line, the end of the day, we're in the business of telling great stories. And there is no greater story to be told on our stage than the story that Lorraine Hansberry has created with A Raisin in the Sun. It is as vital and as relevant today as it was when she wrote it all those many years ago. And that's why we chose to tell this story. That's why we chose to include A Raisin in the Sun as part of our current season. And that's why I hope you'll come down and see it, along with many, many of your friends. Um, let me start things off with Spirit. Spirit sitting right here. Spirit is our assistant director. She's been assisting Regender throughout this process. Sarah mentioned that we produced one of Spirit's plays a few years ago, One Ninth, a play that toured the state. And we're very proud to have Spirit associated with this production. And Spirit is so knowledgeable about this era. You mentioned earlier that you kind of live in this era because of your day job. Uh, and uh, so, Spirit, tell us a little bit about the context of this, how this play was created. I know you guys have microphones there to share. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, Sarah gave you a brief plot synopsis of the play, but there's some truth to this story. Lorraine Hansberry had a personal connection. Talk to us about how this play was created. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I'm glad to be home um, at the Clinton School. Um, in order to get a true understanding of the context of the play, we would really have to spend some time talking about the institution of slavery and the aftermath of that and the impact that that institution that lasted hundreds of years had on a nation. In the essence of time, um, I'm going to skip forward to a very familiar court case, the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson case which established the separate but equal doctrine. So setting up Jim Crow laws and black codes that flourished throughout the entire United States. Um, as you know, 
every aspect of life was segregated and the stamp was put on it by law and each state had their own versions of these laws. But for example, education we all know. Um, housing in this case, Lorraine Hansberry's family lived in Chicago and her father was actually instrumental in fighting uh, covenants, restrictive covenants that segregated black and white neighborhoods. Um, just to put it in context of the era of the 1950s, uh, it takes place in the 50s, so you have the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education case that outlawed segregation in education. But after that, you think of 1955, the Montgomery bus boycotts. Uh, 1955, Emmett Till, a 14-year-old boy actually from Chicago visiting Mississippi, was lynched. And so there's so many different elements, um, the ties to Africa, slavery, lynchings, uh, the great migration that led blacks from the south to the north to obtain better employment. But to find out when they got there, things were segregated and Lorraine Hansberry's family was actually instrumental in trying to break that down. So in a nutshell, I'm just going to put that out there. Does anybody want to add anything to the context before we move forward? Well, let me ask the, <clears throat> so Lorraine Hansberry's family experienced the, the plot of the play, when our audience comes to see A Raised in the Sun, they're seeing almost an autobiographical story. Was there any one character in the play that Lorraine Hansberry identified with more than others, or were, were the various characters a, 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 an amalgam of her story? I believe that Benita is one of the characters that, you know, you can see Lorraine Hansberry in uh, to a great extent, but I feel like there are remnants of Lorraine Hansberry and her experience, her family's experience, represented in all of the characters. Um, back to the covenants uh, that her father fought. They lived in a segregated neighborhood and when they moved to, they decided to move to a white neighborhood, they were terrorized. Um, bricks were thrown through their window and just like in other places where people tried to move into white neighborhoods, and there were actually deeds that said that you cannot rent or sell to black families. So it's definitely integrated into the themes of the play. And of course, there are many themes. One of the things that makes a play a classic, makes a play timeless, is the fact that, that Lorraine Hansberry weaves so many themes into the story that she tells. But before I get to the themes with Rajendra, let me ask one more question about Lorraine Hansberry. She was 29 when she wrote A Raisin in the Sun. And I know that she studied in many institutions. She was a world traveler. Tell us a little bit. I also know that she, she passed tragically at a young age. What, after the play was written, and she won all, so many awards, and the play was acclaimed and brought to stardom so many people, what, what happened to Lorraine Hansberry after, after A Raisin in the Sun, after, after the dust settled with this production? Well, according to my research, um, even though she put everything, her, her life's work, um, everything that she learned through her experience gaining an education in the United States and abroad. Um, I don't know if she anticipated the reception that it received. Um, running on Broadway 500 and, or having over 500 runs. Um, she actually went on to write more works. Um, she was an artist, she was a writer, she continued writing plays. And unfortunately, yeah, she did die at a young age, at 34. But um, she was a feminist. She worked with the women's movement. Um, after a Raisin in the Sun, it seems as though she cracked an opening in terms of the consciousness of what was going on, the reality of black America. And in the early 60s, she joined other movements um, that were emerging after the 50s, the tumultuous 50s, the, the peak of the modern day civil rights movement. Regender, let me turn to you with a question. Um, you were the assistant director on the production that was on Broadway uh, with Sean Combs and Felicia Rashad and others, uh, and you worked on the film of that uh, um, story. A Raisin in the Sun is probably, if not the, most produced play by an African American playwright. I don't know if August Wilson's plays have, have trumped that or not yet but certainly it is among the most produced plays. As a director, uh, how do you wrestle with that footprint? How do you uh, accept what has come before, the shoulders of all of the, great story, all of the great productions of A Raisin in the Sun? How do you manage that to tell your story here in Arkansas? 
How do you incorporate that or dismiss it? And, and uh, how does this differ from your production on Broadway? Wow. Um. <laughs> and, and, and do all, like a minute and a half maybe? A minute and a half. 30 Scooby, words. Scooby-Doo. Uh, <laughs> no, I think that, um, I mean, anything that I work on, there's always a great responsibility to the legacy. Um, I had the privilege and the honor to spend time with Lloyd Richards, who is the original director of the show, and was the former head of Yale School of Drama, and brought all of August's works to Broadway. And Lloyd always stressed within me, um, as one of my fathers in the theater, that the play, and any time you sit in the chair to direct a show of this magnitude, the responsibility that you have. And I pull a lot from my own family. My father's from India, my mother's Bahamian. But a lot of the cultural things that you know happened in the play happened in my own childhood in terms of relationships with money and politics. Uh, my sisters trying to be more and cultural things, trying to hold them back because they were women. Um, I think that the play on Broadway, and I said this to you privately, but I'll say it publicly, I think what we have accomplished here in Arkansas without you know, being uh, vain is I think that we really accomplished what Miss Hansberry's vision was originally, but when it opened on Broadway with Mr. Pottier, um, who is one of my national heroes from the Bahamas, there were still a lot of things that were restricted and that they feared that um, the white audiences wouldn't get. And then, of course, when we did the revival with Felicia and Audra, the play, um, I, think, I think the play was challenged because Sean was new to the craft of acting, and it became, which was... That was a very polite way of saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think what was, what was Lloyd's fear and what Sidney and Lloyd fought, because when the play was originally done, Sidney and Lloyd uh, fought with Miss Hansberry and the actress who played Mama. They had legendary fights and rehearsals. And there was one point where for about a week, Miss Hansberry wasn't talking to Sidney and only spoke through Lloyd and Lloyd didn't speak to da da da. Because the question of the whole thing was whose play is it? And who is really the ultimate protagonist of the play? And what Mr. Pottier said so beautifully one day was that if you removed Walter Lee, there would be no play. It is by his actions, much like Hamlet, or not to act, that changes the trajectory of all these people's lives. And so um, it was interesting because playwrights often know what their plays, they believe this is what it's about. And so to be able to have it change. And so when we did it on Broadway, um, Felicia, once again, you know, history was made. Felicia became the first African-American woman to win a Tony for lead actress. We had never won in all the history of the Tonys lead actress to that point. And Audra McDonald at 35 became the first African-American woman to receive her fifth Tony for her work on Broadway as an actress. Um, but at the same time, you know, for me, this play, which you're going to see at the rep, is connected so deeply to the images historically of what spirits started with, with Africa and the Middle Passage. And you're gonna see, you know, influences of photography and things that I pulled from that the, when Lloyd planted the seed in my head all those years ago, said, you know, this is what we, we weren't able to do, but what I hope you will do. And, you know, Bob has been, and the rep have been supportive of my vision um, in supporting that. And the play for me feels very relevant because the issues, and I said this in a, an interview down here, you know, I can drive down to certain parts of Arkansas and Little Rock, and you can still see Walter Lee's and you can still see Mamas, and you can still Ruth's and Benita's, and people fighting for the American dream. And um, I think that as an activist, like the, Miss Hansberry and her relationship with James Baldwin, who's one of my personal heroes, they were best friends. And the idea of cracking that, that glass ceiling that existed on Broadway. You know, up until this point, the only performer that was actually kind of embraced fully, as a fully realized human being, was Lena Horne. And so to have um, a play that was not about rich black folks, you know, but middle class, struggling, poor black folks who had pigmentation, like black folks, blue, black, purple, black, 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 as we say, um, 
on stage and women with full hips and gray hair and wearing and and all of that it gave us an opportunity to see ourselves fully re reflected we weren't just maids and chauffeurs and butlers and saying yes ma'am and no ma'am we were fully realized human beings and so for me every modern scholar and every african american artist you know from Denzel to Whoopi to Oprah, everyone looks at this as the moment because not only did it introduce Lloyd and Miss Hansberry and Sydney and Ruby and all these great artists, but modern black American theater would never be the same. We could never go back to before. We had seen ourselves reflected. And so the responsibility and the call went out. And when she died, you know, James Baldwin wrote in her, her eulogy, he said that the the, the theater is quiet today because one of its lionesses was taken too soon because of breast cancer. Um, and I think to myself what she would have been had she lived, because certainly Lynn Nottage, who was my friend who sat here a few years ago, and every American playwright of color, but particularly women of color, they take their hat off to her because she was the first. She was the bridge. Thanks. And you know, talking about the director, playwright relationship, the analogy that I always use is that the director is the general contractor and the, the, the playwright is the architect. And so there is a, a give and take back and forth in that relationship too that I think is very important every time you start out on a new play. Uh, Tafik, let, let me bring this to you. You are an actor. This is your second time at the Rep. We're so glad to have you back. Um, Regendra referenced your character, Walter Lee that if Walter Lee wasn't there, this story wouldn't take place. Um, also, great actors have, have, have portrayed this role that you're bringing to life on our stage and doing it so well. Um, what preparation, what kind of work does it take to create a character that is as well-rounded, but at the same time so explosive as Walter Lee? <sighs> well, um... I, w I will say that I've, I've kind of been blessed to have a, uh, a couple of years of experiences in different aspects in my life that I am able to pull from and understand Walter's journey. Um, like Walter, I'm a man of passion. Um, you know, Walter has a day job. You know, he's a chauffeur, but he's not content with that. And uh, myself, growing up, I've had n numerous jobs. I was in the Marine Corps, I left that. Became a correction officer, I left that. And people were looking at me like, you're crazy, you got a job. Um, then I joined the fire department, which I did feel comfortable with, but I knew something was missing. Um, and during all those years and all those jobs, I still dabbled in the arts, whether it be dancing or acting. And it finally hit me that being an artist was my passion. Um, and there's a lot of struggle internally and externally uh, in your life with following your passion and your dreams because you have so many people that depend on you, wives, kids, children, and you have to get them to believe in you and to support you so you can pursue your dreams. Um, and I'm able to call on all those years of experiences um, and doing those different jobs in my life. Um, and I can pull from that pain and joy and use that in, in the role as Walter. Good, and I, 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 I wanna uh, move to Phyllis here too and ask a similar question. Uh, playing Mama, the matriarch, the widow of the family, the, you know, the catalyst for the story is that her husband, Big Walter, has passed away and left them an insurance check. And everybody has a different opinion about how to spend that insurance check. And it's mama's insurance check. You know, and, and you're, again, what is it about this character you're playing that you think has resonated with audiences throughout time? I mean, and also, you're playing an, uh, a character that is older than you and uh, uh, perhaps has a different life experience. How do you incorporate that into your own work? Well, being from North Little Rock, even though I didn't grow up here, my summers, and as I was saying to someone yesterday, the, the most important parts of my life, and who makes me as a person and as an artist, come from 
here. Um, last evening, someone was questioning me about, well, where are you from? Well, where did you grow up? What influenced you? And I said, my family here, because my father being in the YMCA, we moved so often. So the only thing that I could count on, the only thing that was stationary, the only thing that was always the same was the family. I knew that I was going to come to A24 East 14th Street, that the phone number was Franklin 49012, it still is today, <laughs> that I was going to walk on the porch. There were things that were consistent. My aunts were domestics. My grandmother was a, it worked in a nursery at Park Hill. Right. So I, I saw these women, but because my father, like Walter, was a visionary, he, he saw beyond Little Rock, and he got us out of here, but he never let us forget here. He always made us remember and appreciate from whence we came and what the struggle was. And so for me, first of all, I, I never thought about playing Lena. It was never even in my desire place. I never, I didn't think I was ready to do Lena. And it was actually one of my students that sent me the email. And um, it was in Little Rock. And I'd never worked in the rep because the rep was in a place that I was welcome, I felt, as an artist. They didn't do plays that I could participate in. And so part of me wanted to just come home because my family that are still here, that still live in the houses and still live in the same places, and they've never seen me work as an artist. So there was much more, the day that I went in for, that I decided to go in for the audition, I just said, okay, well, I'm gonna go. I may not be what they physically think of Lena, but I know that viscerally and emotionally, I can embody her. I want to. And that was the first time I ever thought about doing it when someone sent me the email. Before that, it was like, I'm not ready. I never thought about it. It was one of my favorite movies. I brought it with me. Uh, it's one of the ones that's in my library that I watch periodically because the work is so amazing. The story is so amazing. Um, and so just in preparing for it, I came open and ready and willing. And let me ask you a sidebar question because we, I think many of us are familiar with your work as a film actress and in, in so many of Spike Lee's movies, for instance. How does acting for the camera in a film differ in your opinion, from acting on stage and creating a role on, sta on stage? Well, I'm grateful that I started my work on stage. And I think for anyone that calls himself an actor or an artist, it's important. And if you've not been there, then don't even try it. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, well, Richard Dreyfuss had that experience. Uh, he tried to come to the stage and he thought, it was going to work, and it doesn't translate. Wait, who, who did you say about who you talking Richard about? Richard Dreyfus. Oh, Richard Dreyfus, yeah. Yeah, he thought that he was a film actor and he could go on stage and still be fabulous, and it didn't work. I worked and started on the stage, or on the boards, as we say. Um, I was blessed to work with a man who gave me a, a, a crucial bit of information that I shared with one person in the cast. Um, and he told me this, because stage, you know, we have to get the rafters. We have to make sure that the seats see it, so the gestures and everything can be large and needs to be projected more and, and more um, articulated physically, vocally. You use your entire body. In film, if you feel it, if you think it, it's going to come in the eyes and the camera will come in to get a close-up. So all I have to do, my responsibility as an actor, is to make sure that I'm truly thinking, living, and feeling that moment, and trust that the DP and the director are going to bring the camera angles in to get it. Because if I do anything larger, um, it's going to look ridiculous. So the analogy that uh, William Greaves gave me was to drop the pebble. It's like dropping a pebble in a pond, a very still pond, and the ripples are the emotions, and that's the difference in working on film and theater. Can I just say one thing, Bob, too? Like, I grew up watching her films and stuff, and one of the things that had happened was we had done a reading of my play Little Rock uh, in New York, and it was at the Union Square Theater, and we had, you know, Leslie Uggams and Clifton Davis and all these stars to be part of it. 
and we do a talk back as we did here in Little Rock. I've kept that component where people talk back about the show. And packed places, you know, Oprah folks are all there, you know. Phyllis stood up in the back and she said, I'm Phyllis, and of course, you know the voice, because the voice is kind of iconic, and she says, and I'm from Little Rock, and she's like, I want to talk to you, and then, of course, people were pulling us apart. Fast forward, um, we, Phyllis came in for the audition and blew me away, because she reminded me so much, and I see it here in Arkansas, of people, women who are older in body, but young in spirit. And my mother, who is, you know, in her 70s, can still, like, run a mile and do formidable things. And my mother was my mother and my father, because my dad wasn't around. And so, her Lena is very unique in the sense that she's older, but she has such a young spirit. And her husband died three weeks ago in, the, in our mind, in our production. So she's going through all of the emotions of grieving that you see versus the old, older original production where mama literally sat on the couch. And there's been a stereotype in the American theater that black artists have, like, oh, mom on the couch plays. You know, oh, a lot of Tyler Perry's mom on the couch plays, Medea on the couch plays. Um, but what makes our play unique and fresh is that this mama isn't on the couch. She doesn't sit on, she sits on the couch maybe once. She's cleaning, she's pretending to her children, her grandson. What women every day in Little Rock and throughout the state of Arkansas um, do, black or white. You know, they, they raised their children up. And there was a, she never knew this, and I'm gonna share it with you guys for the first time. I grew up watching with my mother, The Women of Brewster Place, which she was in, a, you know, in the original with Oprah and the amazing cast of women. And what I always thought was the character that you played, when she got older, she would be Lena because she had so many children, you know, in that house. If you remember that scene when they opened the door and Robin Gitt, and she's got 20 kids running around, climbing on her. <laughs> and like, I thought, well, my God, that, but she loved every one of her kids. And I thought that love and the fact that everywhere you look on Phyllis's resume, the, before all of her other awards, her first award is I am in the Black Hall of Fame in Little Rock, Arkansas. And I thought it's time for this daughter to come home. So. You're sitting down there at the end of the table, so I'm, I want to get to you with a question. And that plays Ruth, the wife of Walter Lee, the mother of Travis. They all live in this little one-room house or two-room house together. And it seems to me that Ruth is the intersection of so many of the plot points in this production because she is not of the family. She's the only one in that we meet in the immediate family that's not related by blood to, to mama. And so when you create this character, again, I think that Ruth probably a little older than you might be yourself. Um, um, and what's it like to create this kind of woman? How can you relate to a character like Ruth, who is a domestic, who has to get up and get everybody else up in the morning, get her son off to school, get her husband off to work, deal with the problems that she faces? Uh, how are you wrestling with those challenges when you create this role? Well, uh, this role is a, a role that's very near and dear to my heart, and I still wrestle with her. Uh, Every, every day, every performance. Um, so as when I walk on stage, it'll be something new, it'll be something fresh. But uh, where I started with it was looking at the women in my family, looking at my mother and how she raised me, how even though you know, my father was, was there, how she was the one driving me this place, that place, the other place, comforting my fears and, and, and telling me I could do it in times where there were a lot of naysayers. Uh, also looking at my grandmother and um, my grand aunts, many of whom were domestics, many of whom were the first black nurses in different places. Um, and Interestingly enough, both my mother and grandmother's names are Ruth. Uh, my middle name is Ruth. Um, and so in that way, I, I kind of had to 
sit down and really look at them, the women in my family, as more than just the women in my family. Looking, look at them at, as women and individuals with lives and, and dreams and hopes and fears and disappointments before I was even thought of. And many times spoke to them about what it was like to sacrifice, what it was like to be the glue, to be everything to everybody all at the same time, um, to be the person who was the intermediary between people, um, making sure that the children got raised and making sure that the husband felt supported. Uh, and I mean, it's interesting, I was always uh, very, very close to my grandfather, a little bit more close than, than my grandmother sometimes. <laughs> so after he passed away uh, and I got married uh, shortly before that, sitting down and looking at her and speaking to her as one married woman to another um, who was alive during this time. Her, many of the, the, the plot points of getting my father off, off to school and my, my grandfather, he would work the night shift, so getting everything ready for him before she went out to work. Uh, that was where I, I started and really tried to put myself. Um, and then also recognizing, as Rajendra said earlier, just the legacy. Um, in what way am I, as a woman living now in 2011, how am I continuing their legacy as a woman, as a black woman now? And all of that they sacrificed for me to really take hold of my dreams, even though, you know, a lot of times people may not understand it being an actor. You know, like, you know, as my grandmother said, you know, <laughs> she's like, there are, there are plenty of opportunities for little black girls in teaching, or why not be a doctor? <laughs> you know, because those are the, those are the things that, that they sacrificed for us to be able to do. And so also being able to put forth a new dream and, and for her to say, all right, that's what you want to do. We'll support you. <laughs> um, and every day, all of that goes into this woman um, and being able to understand, you know, where for instance, um, like Benita is coming from, who is Walter Lee's sister, played incomparably by Mixolydia Tyler. She, looking at someone who's also close to her age, but also has had limited resources, and trying to bring everyone together to experience the hopes and the dreams of everyone else in the family. Uh, that's, I think what I am constantly trying to explore. You can see how incredibly personal these stories are for these actors, that the connection to their own lives is essential to the storytelling on our stage. And that leads me to this follow-up question, which I'll just throw out to, to the group here and ask somebody to answer, and then I'm going to get to, I want to get to questions from you guys but you each have your individual stories and your individual journeys that have brought you to this story at this time. Yet this play is about a family that has been living and breathing together for 20, 35 years. How in this 22 day rehearsal process do you create this family unit with such integrity and honesty? Now I know the short answer is, well that's our job, we're actors. But is there anything, Phyllis, you're raising your hand. So let, tackle that question for us. Well, it starts right here. <laughs> I think, 
you know, we can all say the, ca the other cast members are here. And if they yeah, hey, if you're stand cast up. members, raise, let, let us see you. Let us see our other cast members. Stand, stand up, up. Stand, stand up. up. Stand up. I mean. And there you go. And I, I jumped in because I, I say, I've said this, and I know everybody's heard me say it. We, we say it to each other. Even the rehearsal process, I mean, the audition process, you were so you felt comfortable, you felt protected, you felt someone that really cared about you. Because he has created the environment with, in which we can be comfortable to play and to expose ourselves. And um, he will always be my go deeper director. <laughs> go deeper. So, um, <laughs> Uh, so it's really, no matter what we do, um, he first of all assembled an amazing cast, an amazing cast. I, we, I'm still watching the show when I'm not on stage. I still don't go to my dressing room. I sit and I watch the other actors work because everyone is really that good. And, that, and, and they're giving that level of work, that level of commitment, that le level of, of, they're just giving and Rajendra has created the environment with which we can play and feel comfortable, and I think that's where it began. Good, good. Now, um, Tafik, go ahead. Yeah, to add to that also, I, I say it starts with Rajendra. Um, I remember him saying that when he, uh, when he casts, when he holds auditions, one of the things that he um, considers along with talent is the spirit of that person. Um, and you can definitely tell that not only are my cast members talented, but each one of us has some type of spiritual connection. And it started from myself and Lynette and uh, Segun trying to get here on the plane. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I remember last time when I came out here, I didn't speak to my cast members before I got on the plane. This time, we all found each other we missed our flight, and we're already acting like brothers and sisters trying to figure out how we're going to get another flight out here. So it started from us meeting at the airport. We instantly were connected. And I think Rajendra has that type of uh, vision where he just knows how to put people together who are already going to be spiritually and have right. that connection. So it makes our job much easier once we get into the rehearsal process. Well, you know, um so I think alluded to the fact that they tried to get here. You know, this play began rehearsal right, literally the day after the big snowstorm in New York City when everything was shut down. Now, uh, Mixa, you got here, and who else got here? You guys, you guys were here, but everybody else was in New York. And with a 22-day rehearsal process, lose, you, you remember reading, seeing on the news that it was like days before you could get out of LaGuardia Airport. And it was, in fact, days before we got these guys here. So we rented a studio space in New York City, and Rajendra assembled the remainder of the cast, and they began rehearsing in New York uh, so that we wouldn't lose time uh, in the process. And so you know, that experience, uh, sometimes adversity brings us close together. And it, it was interesting, though, too, because Bob and I were talking, and I, you know, as my producer, I said, well, we're going to cancel the first preview. Like, you know, I went, I was so nervous because, you know, losing. Yeah, what did I say to that question? And he was like, no. <laughs> He's like, no. <laughs> no. No, 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 no. But it was, it was interesting because losing a week of rehearsal with a show as intense and as important as this, um, you have to rely on your faith and your instincts. And, you know, for me, and I thank my actors and my family and the rep for, for their love and support. You know, for me, it, it's having had the Broadway experience, I felt that in many ways that I didn't honor the legacy of Lloyd as the assistant director. Because I really couldn't, I had made some powerful decisions, but I couldn't make, I wasn't the director. And thy, thee who sits on the throne is the king. Um, and can make the decisions. So what had happened was, you know, after I did the movie and I did the show on Broadway, I got a lot of offers from major regional theaters to do it. But I wasn't healed because I had imprints from the Broadway production on my spirit. And 
I waited and waited, and my agent's like, you know, these are major theaters. What are you doing? You're crazy. And I said, God will let me know when I'm ready. You know, he's brought me this far. He'll let me know. And then Bob and I had always talked about it. And when Bob said, you know, what about raising the season? And the number 2011 just kept coming to me and saying, this is the beginning of a really important year in my life with Little Rock inching its way towards Broadway in the fall, coming here and doing the show as the director and healing my, you know, my wounds and honoring Lloyd, who was a major force in my life, the first black man to direct on Broadway. And he was mentoring me, you know? And I was, I'm from a little island in the West Indies. And to have that responsibility and that legacy and to bring it to Little Rock and to the rep, which has been so instrumental in my life and my artistic growth. I have a show coming to Broadway because of Little Rock, because of you, because of the nine. And that doesn't happen to little kids who run in the Bahamas on a beach with no <laughs> shoes. And so for me, this is my gift back to the city that has given me so much. And I think of like my grandmother who passed away this year, who was the one that said, you know, Sidney Poitier, be like him, be like him, follow him, follow him, follow him. Because that was, that was the only roadmap that a Bahamian woman had to America, to the theater. And now today her grandson sits at the Clinton School as a panelist talking to you fine folks. So God is in all things. And um, I'm grateful to be here and to be with all of you and to give this as a gift and to Miss Hansberry and to, as I said to the cast privately, to have what I did on Broadway and what I didn't do on Broadway off of my ledger because this is the best production of Raisin, hands down, you will ever see. Let's open up for questions. What would you all like to talk about? Yes, in the back. And we've got a microphone, and we need to get everybody to ask their questions in the mic. For me, in, living in Brooklyn, this play, I, the projects, the lower income uh, New Yorkers that I p live in my community, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, white, uh, this story is happening every day. We're wrestling with what it is to be African people living in America. We're wrestling with the baby boy syndrome. I was one of them. My mom was my mom and my dad. Um, we were talking in rehearsals one day saying, one of our cast members said, you know, uh, who had a similar journey said, you know, my mom, my dad was never in the house and he never taught me how to tie a tie. And I burst into tears because for years I thought I was the only one that didn't know how to tie. All my ties are pre-tied <laughs> because my dad never taught me how to do that. And so it, I think it resonates every day. I mean, I think that if you look with hip hop and the urban culture that's happening and the crossover of it, there's a lot of Walter Lees um, who, even, even as our president sits in the White House today, there are even more Walter Lees, and they're not just African Americans um, who are angry and hungry and have the dream, but see it slipping away. And then, you know, there are countless black men who are trying to take their place in their homes, but they have very strong moms and mothers from a generation that wrestle with that. And so I, I think that it's very personal and it's very relevant today. I went driving yesterday, I went to the Tyson chicken farm, the factory up and, and, and to see so many Hispanic people like working and working and working. And, and I was, it was just amazing to me 
to, to see that and to say, wow, these are Walter Lees. They're trying to live their dreams. And how many of them want to be on Broadway? How many of them want to be at the Clinton School? But they, don't, they can't see the roadmap. So. And Duffy? also to add to that, um, as a New York City firefighter, I get to go into people's homes when I respond. And I can tell you, and I work in Harlem, um, I can tell you there are so many homes I go into, whether they be projects or, or brownstones or multiple dwellings, where you have families who have six or seven kids and a mother in there, or you have families with just an older brother there, and there is no mother or father. And all of the things in this play, you see Ruth, you see Mama, you see Walter, to this day, and we tend to forget that because there are some changes, because there are maybe a group of African Americans making more money, that now that doesn't exist anymore, but it still exists to this day. And I think the way the director, I mean, one of the things that we, I laugh, I haven't told her to this, but if you look at my script, there are no black lines, because he, the first thing he told us was, get rid of all the directions. Get rid of all the directions. So that was like, yes! So he's going to put another imprint on it. But everything that's in this story, because it was so well written, it's valid. It's, it's today. It's timeless. The themes are timeless. The characters are timeless. The relationships are timeless. And they are as valid when she wrote them as they are, t I mean, you know, today. So, yeah. Yeah, there, uh, the, the play was extremely well written and um, Lorraine Hansberry had incredible foresight for her time. Many of the things that she wrote in the play were not just just uh, restricted to then, but have proven themselves true in much of what Asagai has said about many African nations that have gone through different coups looking for, searching for independence, searching for the pillar to stand on. Um, and what this play also does is it forces us all to look back uh, because, you know, the economy right now and we're so nervous about you know the American dream that many people may have once had but now it's slipping away due to the economy um, and those who haven't had seem to keep not having and then wonder what is it that we fight for are we fighting for money or is it equality but then this play really rings true in showing very basically there are certain things that money cannot buy there's certain parts of being a human being that we really have to wrestle with and grasp onto first in order to have the resilience to go forward and grasp the dreams that maybe everyone else is telling us that we cannot achieve or that circumstances are proving that we can't. I'm going to, I'm going to, we have one, only time for one more question. I'm sorry to cut you off here, but I want to get in at least one more question and I know we've got to wrap things up. So let's go ahead with that, with that next question. Thank you. Uh, I'm a volunteer here and I'm glad you all came and with the panel and gave information out, but I wanted to comment this young lady here, she says she's from 14th Street, the North of Rock. And I have a daughter that's in acting, and you know, I, I've tried to encourage her to go into another field, but <laughs> today it's changed my outlook quite a bit. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions just for her benefit. She's at Parkview Arts and Magnet School, and I didn't know if you all panel had made arrangements to go and talk to these young people. The Hamlet, the Hamlet cast, attended there and uh, they were very inspired so I thought this may be an inspirational opportunity for her. But uh, one other thing I'd like to also say is to Renato, the, your director, it's not a question, I'm just trying to pull a plug, <laughs> that she's a very good actress and if you decide, <laughs> if you're looking for any cast members that are 17 to 24, that category, 
then I'd like to, uh, for you all to keep that in mind, I will be coming to the production because she was in the rep in the review to review the summer. So uh, I will we'll be coming to the rep to see Raising the Sun. Well, let me say this. Um, the two young boys, I'm going to turn over to Spirit because I want her to chat about it because Spirit is from here and she keeps me honest because she is constantly reminding me how the rep is a national theater, but the rep is first a local theater. And so local impact is really vital. But I will say this, the two young boys in the show that play Travis, we have two boys that switch off each performance. Are, I, I, yesterday we had an event with the Lynx, and I was very emotional because I remember looking into their eyes and seeing myself because these kids in Arkansas, are give, they are passionate about acting in the theater. They are passionate about the arts. And I remember growing up where people would put a basketball in my hand, and my mom put Shakespeare and Ibsen and Shaw. And to see these kids getting it and wanting it, I'm so proud of, of, um, of their school, Booker, Booker. Booker Arts Magnet. Booker Arts Magnet, mm -hmm. because these, I walk in there and these young men are relishing theater and dance and ballet and jazz, and, and it's happening here in Arkansas. And those are going to be the next Alvin Ailey's. Those are going to be the next Sidney Poitier's. So Spirit, I'm going to turn it over to you. Do you want to? Well, actually, I was going to tie into what Ruth was talking about, your question. But I, I had the opportunity to work with these two boys who have done performances in their church and at their schools. But this is the first professional production that they're involved with. To tie into what Ruth was saying and to culminate everything that has been said, to answer your question, the legacy is something that's very important about this play because at the end of the play, it's in Travis, Travis's hands. He's the little boy in the play. And all of the work that has been done, like you said, one time the values were freedom and running away from being lynched and then it became a financial issue. It became about money, but what is this generation going to do with what has been placed in our hands? and Travis represents us right here. Um, to answer the question about development, there is an event on Monday at the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center. I can provide more information about that after for young aspiring artists. I wanna thank you all for being here today. Come back and see our production. It opens officially. We have previews on, pay what you can on Wednesday, preview on Thursday. Official opening night is Friday where we'll, we'll have an re opening night reception with our cast. And then we run for three weeks after that. So I do hope you will come and see this production, see these actors bring this wonderful story to life on our stage. Thanks to the Clinton School for hosting us today and thanks to all of you for joining us for this conversation.